Tonight we are in Amsterdam. We are celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Cultural Academic Center SPAU 25. And one of their uh, events that they have organized is uh, an event on the future of the humanities from a European perspective. I believe that the social sciences and humanities have to assert a position in the mainstream of research, that they cannot and should not be diverted into a backwater, uh, subservient or subsidiary to the, the mainstream of research in uh, the other sciences. You see that the current view of the purpose of research and education is much more limited than Gresham 400 years ago believed. Nowadays, we're expected to undertake research to boost innovation and competitiveness in Europe, to give a direct stimulus to the economy, and to secure our science and technology base. Now, I'm not arguing, of course, that one shouldn't try to uh, boost innovation and competitiveness or uh, enhance our industrial base, but how should we do that? Should we do it, as is often argued, by funding the science and technology base, the natural and physical sciences and or in engineering, and assume that that itself will bring innovation and economic growth? The evidence for such a proposition is actually not very good. Um, Innovation does not automatically lead, scientific research does not automatically lead to invention, it does not automatically lead to innovation, it does not automatically lead to economic growth. While politicians have for many years sought to boost manufacturing industry, its role within the economies of developed nations has consistently fallen. And that situation has continued. This country has prospered, as it did in the golden age, through the service economy and has been leading in that respect, as you can see again, uh, in relation even to the United States and the United Kingdom ever since. So economies can prosper and in fact do prosper on the back of things other than and separate from manufacturing industry. So the implication is that future innovations are likely to be not in manufacturing, not in um, making products, but in how we do things, changes in our methods, the ways in which we live. And that's particularly because most of the great challenges which face our economies and our societies at the moment are challenges for the social sciences and humanities, not for the natural and physical sciences. If we look at the core uh, humanities, and especially at uh, foreign languages and literatures, and perhaps even our own national languages and literatures, uh, we could compare the situation of these to what about 100 years ago was the situation of the classics. Uh, they were the staple of a university education. Uh, usually they were also meant as a sort of fence around an elitist uh, segment of the population, usually male, uh, that through its knowledge or pseudo-knowledge of the classics set itself apart from the hoi polloi. Now, with democratization um, and increasing nationalization of, uh, of national university curricula, uh, the arts, and especially foreign languages and literatures, and to a certain extent, I think, history, uh, has taken the place of what used to be uh, the classics. And just as the classics, I think, now are still kept alive in, you know, uh, carefully tended reservations in not even all of our universities, but at least in some of our universities. There well may be a future for us where you know, we as professors of languages, especially of literatures, will also be given a nice place somewhere on the top floor, uh, preferably with a window seat as they do in Japan for those people that are no longer useful for the enterprise. And then we can fill our days by you know, looking out the window and, and being cultural. Our thinking of the past is actually determined not by the past, but by the present, and even more so by what we expect as our future. So we look back to the past from the perspective of the future through the lens of the present, so to speak. If we apply that to Europe, 
The question then becomes, how do we see our future in order to see our past? Do we see our future as national, you know, which is one of the problems we're facing now. If the euro fails, if Europe implodes or explodes or whatever, do we return to nationalist, fairly narrowly nationalist visions uh, of our future? Then will we also look back to our past in a traditional sense um, and will we reaffirm national canons, national histories, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, the contradiction here, of course, is that it's often that segment of the population that's most nationalistic in its reflexes that is also least concerned or least convinced of the value of the humanities because of their supposed elitist usefulness okay, or uselessness. If we see our future as European, then the humanities could become a critical reflection uh, and also a contribution to, let's just call it the American uh, the, not the American, the European dream. Uh, I chose this title because I think that among you, uh, a certain number have doubts about literature and the study of literature, its value, the value of reading, thinking that uh, it doesn't pay as, uh, as an investment, as uh, what is the, profit, the profitability, the return on investment of reading and of literary studies. Higher education is a business. Students are consumers and they are making choices that will impact probably the second or third largest investment. Mr. Lore, the uh, president said, they deserve to know the outcome. Students come to us as a consumer, but they leave as a product. In this context, of course, the humanities are highly vulnerable. Uh, we should try to respond to this challenge by posing the question of their relevance, their legitimacy in those terms. We should try to justify literature reading without relinquishing the intrinsic value of literature in the terms of the benefits. I will turn to Proust to look for a solution to this problem. Proust, the prophet of literature, didn't ignore that literature and culture could serve, as we already saw, to get out of oneself to know the other. But his narrator also evokes, in Sodom and Gomorrah, which I edited, the man of action, busy and always stressed, who in the salon look down at him, the narrator who pretends to become a writer. And he describes the self-satisfaction felt by busy men, however idiotic their business, at not having time to do what you are doing. It is, of course, justifiable for the man who draws up reports, adds up figures, answers business letters, follows the movement of the stock exchange, to feel an agreeable sense of superiority when he says to you with a sneer, it's all very well for you, you have nothing better to do. But he, be, he would be no less contemptuous, would be even more so, for dining out is a thing that the busy man does also, were you recreation, writing Hamlet, and, or merely reading it. Proust denounces the blindness of the man of action, limited, and insensitive to the role of literary and culture in professional life, reducing it to entertainment, leisure. And this is how the narrator contradicts. Wherein business, busy men show a lack of forethought for the disinterested culture which seems to them a comic pastime of idle people when they find them engaged in it is they ought to reflect the same as that which in their own profession brings to the fore men who may not be better judges or administrators than themselves, but before whose rapid advancement they bow their heads saying, it appears he's extremely well-read, a most distinguished individual. Now we, are, we enter the heart of the matter. Proust observes that the administrator the judge, the lawyer, the engineer, the doctor, when they are better read, are more successful in their business. 
go further in their career, get bigger bonuses, probably. I'm not far thinking that Proust is right, even though, as with Baudelaire again, there is some irony in that passage. After all, Proust uh, speaks a little like Bourdieu, or Bourdieu like Proust, speaking of distinction, the most distinguished individual. And as we know, this distinction rhymes with reproduction, discrimination, and segregation. Culture might be mere name dropping, as I said. The well-read man will go further because he's one of us.